this. This is TLV1. TLV1 Radio. Great, great mixer. I like Tel Aviv. This is TLV1. This is... Tel Aviv is a beautiful city. Great city, great radio. TLV1. This is... is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review with Gilad Halpern. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review, a program dedicated to the word, to the thought and to debate. I'm your host Gilad Halpern and every week I'll be engaging in close encounters of the intellectual kind with writers, scholars, researchers or simply people of all types and vocations who have done something to make our lives a tad more interesting. And on our show today, our first guest will be Professor Anita Shapira, one of Israel's most eminent historians of Zionism and author of a new biography of David Ngorian, our country's founding prime minister. It has just been published in English by Yale University Press and she'll be here to tell us all about David Ngorian, the man. Our second guest will be Igor Schwartz, Professor of Hebrew Literature and Director of Heksharim, the Research Institute for Jewish and Israeli Literature at Ben Gurion University of the Negev, and author of numerous books, including, most recently, The Zionist Paradox, colon, Hebrew Literature and Israeli Identity. It just came out in English. It was published by Brandeis University Press, and it analyzes the unique Israeli conceptualization of place, what belonging or attachment to a certain habitat means through five canonic literary works written between 1853 and 1963. This is our show today. Do stay with us. We'll be back right after this musical break.
You're listening to the Tel Aviv Review here on TLV One. I am Gerard Halpern. Welcome back. I am now joined here in the studio by Professor Anita Shapira. She is one of the, this country's most eminent historians of Zionism. And we're here to discuss her latest book, a biography of David Ben-Gurion, Israel's founding prime minister and arguably the foremost Jewish leader in the 20th century. A kind of... George Washington, Charles de Gaulle, and Chiang Kai-shek rolled into one. Hello, Anita, and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Thank you. Uh, so Ben-Gurion is such a central figure in the history of Israel and the Jews in the 20th century that several biographies have been written about him. His personality and policies featured in hundreds, if not thousands, of historical studies. So my question to you, Anita, when you set off to write this book, what did you have in mind? What were you seeking to accomplish? Well, actually, I thought, you know that Ben-Gurion uh, featured in many of my books, and he was always the eminence Greece behind the scenes. And he was the most important figure, even when he was not the hero. In my book about Igal Alon, about Beryl Katzenelson, uh, in my study about the clashes in during the War of Independence. But it was always a figure on the side. Mm -hmm. And I thought that it's high time that I take on the challenge and try to, to, to write about Ben-Gurion. You know, why didn't I choose him earlier? Exactly. You, you arrived at Ben-Gurion at, uh, after decades of, uh, of, of your right. career. Why, exactly. Why, why, why wasn't it the other way around? Why didn't you start with Ben-Gurion and then uh, went down, as it were, to the others? Well, the, f the fact is that I always cherished more writing about figures that seemed to me weak, full of doubts, a very, very uh, uh, given to uh, to failure, and Ben Gurion seemed too strong, too uh, resolute, too much of a figure that did not fit the idea of what would be interesting to write about. Mm -hmm. But. Because that was the persona that he tried to exhibit, right? Exactly. That, that's exactly what he wanted people to think. Exactly. So what I wanted to do in this short biography was to uncover the unknown Ben-Gurion. Mm. The Ben-Gurion per person, persona that was not uh, in the public domain. Mm -hmm that he tried to hide all the time. Yes, but perhaps as opposed to the other biographies, this is not necessarily or not only a political biography of Ben-Gurion. You focus a lot about Ben-Gurion, the man. That's which, right. Uh, as we all know, the conventional wisdom, which is w what you just said, you, you, the, the, the preconceptions that you had about him is of a very adamant, very resolute, very uh, driven uh, political uh, figure. So when you unpacked his personality, what were the contradictions that emerged? Well, it seemed that it was his aim to keep his more uh, sens sensitive, more vulnerable personality hidden. He wanted to appear to us as what he thought a leader should be. He should be very determined, very obstic uh, obstinate, very self-assured. And behind it, there was a man that was driven by doubts and by sympathies and by weaknesses that he tried to hide from us. So can you give us an example about some historical junction where his doubts and his... Okay. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. You know, Golda Meir, when I interviewed her in 76, I think, she was already out of office, and she told me, Ben-Gurion always gave us the feeling 
that he did not need any of us. But when I read the documents and the letters from 48, on the eve of the establishment of the state, when Ben-Gurion had to decide whether to go to war and establish the state, or to, to, to wait, maybe there would be another opportunity, he uncovered to her his weaknesses, his feeling of doubts. Will the weapons arrive on time? Will we have a chance to win? And you see these doubts very clearly. And this was a completely different person. Another example, his attitude to the Holocaust. He was so much vilified that he did not show any sensitivity to the Holocaust. And indeed, even myself has written about it. Mm -hmm. But the, now I know that this was the external persona. In his letter to his beloved uh, um, in, in the United States, he uncovered his mm -hmm. feelings, his, feel, his sense of helplessness, his sense of rage. And this was a completely different person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his approach to the Holocaust that you, you just said, perhaps the more... Uh, um, um, well-known one uh, is is that that everything it, it's an example of how everything was inferior to the grand political cause yeah. the Holocaust was a tragedy but at the end of the day it would in some way help the Zionist cause and um, so, so you're, you're saying that uh, in his in his letters he showed the the other, the uh, more um, intimate and more and, and less uh, self-assured um, man. Was he in this way uh, a family man as well, that his, his family was just in the background and the, um, he was married, as it were, to Zionism rather than to Paula? He, he was married to Paula. And at the beginning, this was a great love. But later on, he was sometimes infidel. And uh, what's more, Paula was never a companion. Mm -hmm. Paula took care of him, of his hygiene, of his uh, eating the right things, and so on and so forth. But she was never somebody he could converse with. And as he grew older, on the one hand, he became more attached to her. When he lived with her in Zdebokir, he was very, very uh, annoyed when she left him for a few days and went to Tel Aviv. And he would write her telegrams. Please, when are you coming back? And so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. so, on the other hand, he was a family man because when his son, Amos Ben-Gurion, came to him and announced that he is going to marry a girl, and this girl is not Jewish, he wrote to Paula, Paula, please don't attack him too much. Only softly will do the trick. And... And Paula, of course, attacked him and mm -hmm. uh, nagged him and so on. And Ben-Gurion accepted this daughter-in-law that was not Jewish. So, so would you say that what Golda told you about his attitude towards them, that they always felt that uh, he didn't need them, uh, was this different from his attitude towards his family members? I am sure. I am sure. Even though, you know... Uh, I interviewed one of his grandsons, the eldest one, and he said that the family was divided. Part of the family thought that he was impossible, and the other part of the family adored him. Mm -hmm. So 
it, it depends. Just like his politics, it was very yes, divisive, right? Yes, that's <laughs> right. That's right. It, it's so funny because I think that uh, Amos Ben Gurion's family loved him very much. Renana also loved him very mm. much. I am not sure about Geula, the, the eldest the daughter, mm. because she took the the side of her mother, and uh, I think right. that she, there came the criticism from. I want to take you back to the younger Ben Gurion, to uh-huh. 1906. He uh-huh. was a young man, just arrived in Palestine from a very small town in Poland, and gradually worked his way up to become the leader of the Zionist movement and then, of course, the founding leader of the State of Israel. When he landed in 1906 in Palestine, did he already know that he was going to be the leader of the Jews in Palestine? No, but it was a short while after that that he uh, wrote his father that he does not intend to be a worker in the fields, he is going to be a leader of the workers. So he had this feeling that he was a man with a mission, and also he did not like too much to work too hard. So Mm. these are two sides of the same coin. (laughs) Right. But but, but you said when when you're a 20-year-old man, and you decide that you want to be a leader. You've got to work your way up in, in such a way, you, you have to be so self-assured, and that takes us back to what we think we know of, of ben, Ben-Gurion. And later on, uh, about 20 years later, he would start this um, arms wrestling with Chaim Weizmann, the, the, the godfather of the Zionist cause. It took a lot of chutzpah. Well, I, I, you know... When he started, he was not a very important figure in Palestine. Nevertheless, even then, he already had an inkling that he is going to be a historical figure. We know that because he asked his father to keep his letters from that period. And this Mm. was something that a youth of 20 years old usually does not do. Uh, on the other hand, he was really of no consequence at that time. Really of no consequence. So, so when was the turning point? When did he start to become this, uh, you know, the, 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 the face of, of the Yishuv? I would say not before 33. Then he was, ele- uh, then he won the, the big election in Poland, in Eastern Europe. And the Labour Party became the hegemonic force in the Zionist movement. Even though he had been the the chairman of the Histadwood for about 15 years before? Yes, but even then he was still even not the uncontested leader of the issue, not to mention the fact that he was hardly known outside the issue. Mm -hmm. And actually the world at large did not realize that Ben-Gurion is important until 47, 48. Right. Now, so let's, let's go back to 1933. Okay. Uh, what, what was, how, how did it become, uh, what, what was the transformation from a nobody to a somebody, to, to, uh, to a leader? Was, was it just that he benefited from the growing hegemony of the labor and he just happened to be uh, leading it? Or was it thanks to, to him mainly? Well, I, uh, I think that he was instrumental in winning the elections, and I describe it in the book. And later on, he showed a maturing process. Uh, he started negotiations with the Arabs. He started talking with the uh, uh, high commissioner. He understood that he needs a coalition with the religious, with the Mizrahi party Mm -hmm. since 35. He learned to make compromises, which he did not know before that. And as a result of that, his fame grew. He became a leader. But Weizmann, whom you mentioned, 
would not give him recognition. He was already the chairman of the Zionist organization. Nevertheless, of the Zionist, excuse me, the Zionist executive, nevertheless, Weizmann, whom he helped to re-elect as president, would not acknowledge that they should be equal. Mm -hmm. And he would not give him the privilege to participate in his negotiations. He kept it out of the first rank as long as he could. We always think about Weizmann as being the victim of Ben-Gurion mm -hmm. because Weizmann was articulated, good-looking, and tall. And a gentleman. And, and, a, a, and a wonderful gentleman. Mm -hmm. And he was also urbane. And Ben-Gurion was short and... Uh, noisy and talk too much and not always talk sense and so on and so forth. And he had these, what I call, volcanic eruptions mm -hmm. of rage and so on and so forth. So we tend to think that Weizmann was the victim of Ben-Gurion. However, the truth is that Weizmann treated Ben-Gurion disdainfully. Mm -hmm. Even after Ben-Gurion was the chairman of the Zionist executive. And one must say that Ben-Gurion, until the very end, at least in writing, you won't find a word of a, a dismissal mm -hmm. towards Weizmann. Mm -hmm. He treated him as if he was the historical leader of the Zionist But it movement. wasn't only a, a clash of personalities because they also represented two very different outlooks towards what Zionism should be and how it should be uh, carried out. So what, when was uh, what, this transformation, how, how, how did it really occur? Because it, it wasn't just the two of them in the two separate camps of Ben-Gurion loyalists and Weizmann loyalists. There were also people who believed in two separate ways and at the end of the day, the balance was tilted in Ben-Gurion's favor. First of all, during the Second World War, very early on, Ben-Gurion came to the conclusion that it's time to change orientation from Britain to the United States. And he wrote in a letter to his daughter very early on, I think in 41, if I remember correctly, that after the war there are going to be two great powers, the United States and the Soviet Union. It was very precocious for that time. Yes. And Weizmann would not agree to that. There are letters from him. He says, Ben-Gurion got crazy. He thinks that after the war, it's going to be like that. So uh, it's very dangerous for a historical figure to write letters because then you can see that he was not always right. So first of all, it's a question of orientation. Second, it's a question of what kind of politics you do. Weizmann was the charmer, was the one, the person that one-on-one -on -one was the best. Yeah, when, it, it worked with uh, Balfour. It worked well. <laughs> with all the yeah. Englishmen. Mm -hmm. Ben-Gurion, on the other hand, understood politics as the politics of the masses. You have to activate the masses. He was a revolutionary, if you mm -hmm. wish. And in order, and modern politics depend on masses following you, masses giving you support. And for Weizmann, this was something unheard of. And the third point was that Ben Gurion was short of breath. He wanted Zionism to be realized as soon as possible. S since the Second World War. Mm. And Weizmann was an evolutionist, and he remained an evolutionist to the very end. Mm -hmm. So you can see yeah. that these two figures were on a clash. Yeah, which brings me to my la uh, probably last question, because we, we will have to wrap up soon, Anita. Um, he... 
What, what would you say is Ben-Gurion's uh, most influential policy decision in the long term? His single most indelible mark on the course of history? Well, first of all, it's the establishment of the State of Israel. The decision to establish, to uh, pronounce the establishment of the State, the proclamation... In May 48? In May 48 was uh, something that today seems to us obvious. It was not obvious at all when the Americans cautioned us, you are going to lose, to lose the war and we are not going to bail you out. Uh, when the army leaders tell him, when the army leaders tell him that the chances are 50, 50%. So at that time, when about half the, the provisional government is hesitant, he had to swing the vote in his direction. And he was the man that understood the historical opportunity. Mm -hmm. And when you said at the beginning that he uh, reminds us of Churchill and de Gaulle and... Uh, Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek, etc., etc., you did not mention Lenin. Mm. But he learned one thing from Lenin, that uh, the historical opportunity has to be... Seized. Opportun uh, ...had to be used. If mm. you don't use it, it slips away. And this was something that he had in common with the great revolutionaries of the 20th century. And it came into play all along the way, not just in 1948. That's he, right. Yeah, you mentioned a few other examples where he said, OK, it's, not, it's now or never. As yes, it were. yes, mm -hmm. that's right. And this was one of his strongest points. When Golda Meir said, whenever I contradicted him, uh, at the end he proved right. Mm -hmm. This was exactly this feeling of a historical opportunity that he would not let slip away. Was there some uh, grave error of judgment in one of his decisions that you can uh, that you can retract? Well, I still don't know whether he should have, whether he could have a, a constitution in Israel in the early days of the state. Mm -hmm. He was hesitant about it, and he, as usual, when he did not want something, he projected the feeling that he doesn't have the uh, coalition needed for such a decision. Mm -hmm. And the truth is that maybe he did not have such a coalition. But I think that in the long run, this was a mistake. And had we had a, co co a constitution, maybe some of the ills of the present time could have been avoided. Right. But on the other hand, we have a saying that says, either you don't need it, the constitution, or it doesn't help, right. and which is also true. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? All right. And it's Professor Anita Shapira, a historian of Zionism and the author of numerous books, most recently a biography of Ben-Gurion that was published by Yale University Press. Thank you so much for coming Thank in you. today. Thank you. היה מכחול ואנו שניים מציירים ציור בתוך צבעים שלא יוכלו לראות כאן הייתה קירה ונהר זורם למים עברתי רק כדי לראות הטירה עמדה בראש הגבע בתוכה נפלו הרבה מילים שאיש עוד לא עמד הקירות 
צדוקים הכל כפה ואתה יושב בראש זקוף וכבר מוכן לשלוט קח את שתי ידיי וראה בשתי עיניך היום הכל בוער פחות מציירים ציור בתוך צבעים שלא יוכלו Listening to the Tel Aviv Review here on TLV1. I am Gilad Halpern. Welcome back. I am now joined by Professor Igor Schwartz. He is a professor of Hebrew literature and the director of Hekshorim, the Research Institute for Jewish and Israeli Literature at Ben Gurion University of Negev. We are here to discuss his latest book called The Zionist Paradox Hebrew Literature. And Israeli identity that was recently published in English by Brandeis University Press. It analyzes the unique conceptualization of place in inverted commas, uh, what belonging or attachment to a certain habitat means through five canonic literary works written between 1853 and 1963. Hello Egal and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Hello. So literature, especially with distinctively ideological undertones or overtones in some cases, is a window into the understanding of the relationship of a certain national culture with its uh, physical space, namely the homeland. But the Zionist case is unique in the sense that the cultural narrative, the mythology as it were, uh, preceded the homeland, at least in its tangible form, its, its political form. And as I understand it, this is the point of departure in your, in your analysis. Yes, basically, yes. Uh, you have to understand two points uh, uh, concerning this issue. One is that uh, Hebrew literature, not like other literatures, uh, uh, takes as a uh, mission to shape the future. Uh, in its uh, militaristic ways. And, uh, you know, it's not uh, the, the French, like, like example, the French literature uh, didn't do it. Uh, the Russian, yes. And uh, it, it uh, became, uh, became like this because uh, two factors. One is that uh, uh, the writers of, of Hebrew literature uh, put themselves in the position of the prophets and after that of the, the rabbis, and they became a kind of, uh, you know, a, the viewer of uh, Israel nation future. It was a visionary yeah, uh, uh, yeah. enterprise at the end of the day. In, in a way, we are sitting, uh, uh, the two of us here, because of this mission. I think that the, the Israel was uh, born in the uh, literature of uh, Mapu and, uh, and the text of Mapu and uh, Herzl and the other authors. But in the other side, uh, we pay some kind of uh, commission, uh, not not very good commission for it, because uh, uh, our literature is very ideologic. So when you uh, uh, read just good literature, uh, like, let's say, Proust, uh, he will not have any chance in our uh, context because it's not ideologic uh, uh, enough. 
So that's one side of this. Would you say that about liter- Israeli or, or Zionist or Hebrew literature as a whole? I mean, you picked those uh, five uh, literary works, which we'll get to in, in a second, because they were very ideological. So it, it, you, you made a conscious choice here. No, but it's symptomatic. Uh, let's say that uh, if you look at, uh, there is the three tenors, you know, nowadays, uh, Amos Oz, uh, A.B. Yoshua, and uh, David Grossman, they are the three uh, uh, tenors because they are, in their uh, text, like in Mapuan uh, and Herzl and, and the other three, the private uh, narrative, the self-narrative, connected in a very hard way or very basic way to the national narrative. Uh, no one in the, our literature, if there is no this kind of uh, combination, Gordic, you know, uh, combination, he had no chance to be a very famous uh, poet or, you know. Also the title is National Poet. You know, in uh, uh, French there is no national poet, you know. But uh, in Russia and uh, in, uh, in uh, Hebrew literature there is a national poet. And this is a fact, you know, and uh, there are some sides of it, but we have to... Uh, to see it. Why is Russia more ideological than France? I know that we are veering away from, from Israel, but I'm just interested to know, I- Israel, according to what you say, is not a unique case in this, yeah. in, in this sense. So what makes a certain literary culture more ideological or national than the other? Yeah, you know, you will find in a minute that I'm kind of, let's say, uh, men- that I have a mentalic ways of view on, on life that it's not very popular today. Uh, you know, there are some facts that fa- there are facts, Victor, there are facts. You know, there are, uh, the, the Latins are, are very good in pictures and the English people and the German people are, are not, you know, why there is, except uh, uh, Turner, he is the only famous English uh, painter, you know. And but your see. job as, a, as an academic is to analyze it and understand why, 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 why these facts are, are so. So I think that we are people of words. Also because, you know, the reason that, that in the Bible it's written that we, don't, uh, can, we cannot make sculpture and so on. We, have people of, we are people of words and ideas. And uh, there is something else that connected very much to this book that, like Weber said... Max Weber. The sociologist. Yeah, the sociologist. That, uh, uh, what is very um, uh, typical to the Jewish is that there is a, a gap uh, uh, between, always there is a gap between what they are living in or feeling and between their ideas. And they have to fulfill the, the, this gap. It is, it's, it's internal. You can't, uh, and because of it, we are very uh, much in, in, in a way of fulfilling all over the time. You know, when I wrote this book, but the point of uh, departure was that I tried to understand when I uh, started with this uh, mission to uh, why uh, all the Israelis are not happy with themselves or with their position. Because, uh, you know, after 100 years of Zionism, there are many things to be proud of. Uh, and what I did, I tried to uh, go back to the last 200 years and, uh, you know, uh, reading quite a lot of uh, uh, stories uh, and to tr- try to find out the roots of this uneasiness. And what I find was very, very uh, depressing because no one, and I, I, I'm sure about it, no one of, of these hundreds of writers uh, saw that we can fulfill this mission. Uh, so this pessimism is in, you know, built in. Uh, and what what depressed me more that uh, one day I saw uh, Italian television, and I saw an interview with a very old man from a village nearby the the Etna. And the one that came to interview him, he, he, uh, him asked him, "I can understand what's going on with you people. Every uh, you know decade or something like that, that there is the." The, the mountain the, says his words and the, the far is ruined and uh, why why you are living here? And the uh, uh, old man looked at him and said, I can't understand the question. And that's so you took it for granted that he, he'd lived there because that's his yeah. home yeah. and that's where he belongs. And, and, I, and I hope that one day we will not understand the question. But maybe if, if we're looking about really early uh, literary works here from the actually the, the first uh, um, book that you tackle, The Love of Zion by Abraham Akpo, 
It's the first novel ever written in Hebrew yeah. in 1853, right? So maybe the reason that we're this, for this unease is that they really set the bar high and were very hopeful and very optimistic and had this brilliant program that in many ways fulfilled itself. But at the end of the day, you know, right now we look back and, and see all the, all the faults and, you know, where, where it fell short of the expectations. Yeah, you're right. But there is another uh, uh, reason. The, you know, when you were thinking about, let's say, another settlement, another uh, uh, um, uh, nation that was built from immigrants, let's say uh, the Americans or the Australians or the South Africans, they came to unconquered territory. They have their vision, but they had no... Uh, literature about this new place. It was kind of very new place for them, the Tabula Rasa. The, the, one of the problems is the Israeli uh, or Hebrew uh, uh, literature that we came back to a, a, a territory that was conquered before by many, many texts. So, so when Mapu wrote about Bethlehem, when he was sitting on a mountain in Lita, he, uh, and he draw it like it, you know, with the rivers and water and so on. What he saw in the vision wasn't like the, you know. I will tell you another another uh, scene, a very very famous uh, uh, story by Chavad Janajar, uh, Moshe Smilansky, that uh, was uh, one of the, the first Aliyah member. It's about a guy that came from Russia, and he wanted to see the Jordan. That was his dream. And uh, the writer said that he made many things and so on, and the, the narrator in the story understand the problem. He said, no, you have, you know, see, you, know, see, you can see the, the Kinneret, you can see the, you don't have to see the Jordan. And uh, when he saw the Jordan, he was very depressed because he thought it's going to be like the Volga, not, uh, you know, this uh, little uh, uh, stream. stream. So what he did, he uh, went into the water and drown because he want to show us that you can drown also in the in the Jordan, not in the Volga. <laughs> so, for one way, there was the dream that there was no uh, relation to the Bible and so on. For the other, not like the American um, Western and, uh, and the Australian and the uh, South African literature, we came here with expectation, so high expectation, also because there was the two kingdom before. So there is the gap, the unbearable gap between the utopian in the past, the utopian in the future. So, well, the, the, let's list the five books, the five case, case studies that you uh, write about in this book. Uh, the Love of Zion, uh, written by, as we said, uh, Abraham, Abraham Mapu in 1853, then Herzl's famous novel Alt Neuland from 1902. Uh, Joseph Louis You Ash from uh, 1912, Moshe Shamil's He Walked in the Fields from 1948, and the only properly Israeli book, I would say, uh, Nomads and a Viper by uh, Amos Sartre from 1963. So it encapsulates 110 years, more than a century, of um, Zionist literature, I wouldn't say Israeli because Israel didn't exist, especially in the beginning. But uh, um, wh what, what can you say about the, the meanders, the, the, the process, you know, taking uh, the uh, um, bird's eye view of this panorama of more than 100 years of uh, literature? Where, where was its point of departure that I think we tackled a bit uh, just now? And, you know, take us through it. I will tell you something uh, that I will not answer you, you know, like a petition. I will not answer your question. I will tell you uh, something different, and then I will uh, answer your question. First of all, there is a basic structure that repeats itself. Concerning, let's say, the, uh, what we can say, the human engineering in the book. Uh, all over the way, and it's not, you know, you can find it in other literatures. There is a, a, a basic concept, and you know... It's very, very simple. Let, let's say it's kind of melodramatic, uh, uh, ideological melodramatic uh, book that there is a couple uh, uh, that have some problems and uh, there is a, 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 the, con the, the problems are uh, resolved uh, by some kind of, or, or some kind of new connection to the land. And uh, every time it's in different shape. I will, I will uh, demonstrate it. 
First of all, you know, in Mapu, that it's, uh, you know, I don't know if you know, but uh, many people read the, the, this book in its time, and after they read this book, like I'm telling you, they took the suitcase and, and uh, left their home and go to Israel. That was the, it was speech act book, you know, it's uh, really. And um, first of all, Mapu ignore his uh, surrounding totally. Going back to the uh, to the Bible, like there was no Gola, nothing like that, no Shtetl, nothing, you know. And then he's telling us a story about a couple that they are from the higher society of uh, Jerusalem, Amnon and Tamar, and um, he makes them kind of uh, rural uh, uh, peasants. And you ask yourself why, and then in the end they come back to Jerusalem and everything is okay. And you ask you uh, why, and the answer is that he felt that something is stinking in the in Jerusalem, in the urban place, and the, the, he had to take them to the nature and go back to the uh, Jerusalem, and then uh, doing something new, you know. But it was not such, you know. So in a way, is is uh, conservative, in a way, uh, some kind of revolutionary, and it's in the middle. But if you're looking at the Yoash. Uh, uh, of Yosef Luidor, and the, in the first of uh, the ten, uh, that he wrote his uh, story in the you know in the uh, beginning of the 20th century, you see the real revolution. Why? Because the land became substitute for the god. In Hebrew, it's more uh, dramatic because in Hebrew, it's, it, they took the makom, the place, instead of the makom, the god. It's the same word for both. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, in the in the uh, literature of the uh, Gola, there was a triangle. Uh, there was the home, uh, uh, the temple, and the street. And good Jewish boy or person go between the the home and the and the Bet Neset and the temple. And uh, there was no street. Only the woman went out to the street to make a living. But in Luido. That was the in, uh, beginning of the Israeli, or Eretz Israeli, uh, the, what he did, he said that the home is nothing, there is no need of learning, and the only thing it's that, that, that matter is being part of the nature. And what uh, else is, of course, that the land uh, is the most important part in our life. And if you think about Eretz Israel Shlema, and about uh, the Mitnachalim nowadays. Greater Israel and the settlers. See, you can see the... And what also, I ask myself, you know, not from, uh, I think, from uh, uh, academic way of, uh, of looking, not uh, political. Why we accept all these kind of uh, settlements? Because in a way, they are the only ones who are going on in the trying to gap between the place and the ultra place. You know, they are the only ones who are in, in an utopic mission. And we feel guilt. So in a way, the, we, you know, we don't like it, we think it's awful, but in a way we do nothing. But it's really, so in its beginning, the, in the awful situation, in the beginning of the 20th century, that the, uh, uh, everything that was, uh, uh, you know, connected to the Gula was awful, basically the uh, connecting between the house and the temple. And then, the, the, you know, the, the, the real connection was between the man and the land. No woman. Man and land. And the land was a woman that accept or not accept the man. And that's the way, uh, way that, uh, yeah. And, and the, the two latter chapters, uh, um, Moshe Shamir's uh, book from the 1940s and Amos Oz's book uh, from the 1960s, there were... Um, voices, there were platforms to this new understanding of, uh, I mean, the, the end product of the Zionist cause in a way. Amos Oz himself uh, was uh, uh, born in then Palestine, but in the land of Israel and you know, he spoke Hebrew as his first language, etc. Um, so and Moshe Shamir, of course, yeah. And uh, um, so how do they fit the mold? Because you know th- there is a s- some sort of progression here that uh, that, that takes you to uh, you know a more down to earth sort of uh, uh, framework. First of all, I like you because you think that there is progression progression in the in history. I'm not sure that there are <laughs> progression. You know, there are cycles, not progression, real progression. But you know, it's a way of looking. 
Uh, but uh, let's say, first of all, you, we have to, uh, uh, to understand, everybody of us in the society have to understand that something very dramatic happened in 1948. That was the end of 2,000 years of uh, dreaming, and it's a problem to wake from a dreaming. So uh, some, that was shock. You know, the, it was very nice to uh, dance in the street, but it was a shock. That until today, is a shock because something that you was dreaming about two thousand years. You know, it's like you have a, a lover that you uh, dream about it twenty uh, years, and then you uh, uh, see her, and you know, you know, she is became forty, fifty, and she is not like the way you think. It was a shock. It was a shock. If I try to understand why there is so much violence in Amos and I Ab Yeshua uh, uh, stories. It's because it didn't know how to handle this new situation. Concerning your question, uh, yeah, there are changes. Like uh, in Moshe Shamir book, that was very, you know very uh, important book. Uh, the other who bring new life to the situation of the uh, Israeli, uh, let's say, continuation, is a girl from the uh, Shoah. From the Holocaust, uh, and this girl, uh, Moshe Shamir, depict in very interesting way. From the one side, she is very fruitful; she is very vivid. But the other, she is very uh, ugly. She uh, she is very hairy. Uh, she is uh, immoral. But we have to, uh, you know, put her in the in the uh, situation that we could uh, go on. And this is the right wing. A position that we have to be all over the time in a, a internal a revolution. Because with no internal revolution, or like the communistic uh, way of... Uh, uh, we have no... So Israel must be all over the time in... The other side of Amosos is not less problematic. Because 2,000 years, we had the, uh, the, the vector of patient that said we are in the West. You know, who was in the West or... Uh, in the south, never mind, in Yemen. And our ways is going on the east. Like, you know, Yudha Levi, very famous. Yeah, my heart is in the east, but my body is in the uttermost west. What you can see from the first beginning of the literature of Israel that was <laughs> a very, very em em uh, embarrassing change, because in Amos Oz, uh, from Amos Oz's first uh, story, you can see that we are here in the east, but our heart in the west. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, no, if you, from the uh, two sides, there is kind of uneasiness to be in a native position. You know, there is two kinds of, I must say, because it, it may, maybe it's clear the, the, the whole situation. There is two kinds of narrative about uh, building a nation. One is autochtonic, that say that we are born from this land, and one is in immigration. And our tradition is the immigration narrative, because, you know, Abraham came from Al-Qasim, then we went to Egypt, then we went back, and went to Egypt, we went back, we went to Golad, we went back, and so on, so on, so on, so on. And uh, it's very hard to get rid of this uh, narrative of immigration. But maybe that's exactly what Zionism sought to, to do, to redefine uh, Jewish nationalism as an autochtonic, uh, uh, in, in defiance of history, in a way. Maybe in 200 years from now, if we still be here, it will be... A good yeah, so, so that brings me to, to the last question, Egal. Um, you, the, the last book that you, you analyzed was written more than half a century ago, in 1963. Uh, quite clearly, the early Zionist literature was very ideological. But when you think about literature today, or say in the last 30 or f even 40 years, if you take, for example, I, don't, I think that the best known contemporary Israeli writer is Edgar Keret. Um, it has nothing to do with ideology. It's quite anti-ideological in a way. So. I don't think so. Uh, uh, you see, I will tell you why. In dealing with Edgar Kerr, I like him very much. I think that some, somewhere in the middle uh, 90s, there was a very radical change in the Hebrew culture. Uh, uh, instead of the uh, Zionic narration or narrative. narrative or event that was the frame of reference of our life, the Holocaust became the... the the, the frame of reference of our life. You can see that the beginning of going to uh, Auschwitz and, the, and uh, the, uh, David Grossman uh, uh, see under love and uh, so on. 
and of course I don't like it very much but this is the this is I think it was also because of the Yom Kippur war and the effect of Yom Kippur war but I'm sure about it because I uh, I'm writing about it now uh, sure as you know they can't be sure uh, and in a way if you read Edgar Carrot that is second uh, generation uh, of the Holocaust many of his stories maybe all of these stories impact by the experience of Of being second uh, and he's vis-a-vis this problem uh, dealing let's you see Edgar Carrot have a story it is a legend that uh, Edgar Carrot is not dealing with this uh, subject it's, it's a story that uh, that uh, Abby Yoshua told about him but it's not true let's one of his first story of Ed, Edgar Carrot was named the uh, uh, Hebrew literature what is about you remember it what is about it's about uh, the situation that the are uh, the Palestinian going with tanks and the uh, Um, and, uh, uh, and jeeps uh, in Tel Aviv and uh, the Israelis are uh, you know hiding in the street and there isn't the father of the Israel against the Palestinians so you can say about uh, Edgar Carrot he is not dealing with the situation you know if he was not dealing with the situation nobody will know who is Edgar Carrot in Israel like but, but, but if, if, if we go back to what you just said that um, the Holocaust yeah, substituted no but the, the Holocaust became the paradigm of, of the Israeli polity as it were um, it, it puts us even in a, in a worse position because you know if we were talking about redefining the uh, relationship between the people and the land in a, in a positive manner the Holocaust takes us you know one huge uh, step backwards my dear Gilad I'm very very sorry that I, I'm so pessimistic but I think, you know, I was teaching in Harvard in 1993, and I was shocked, because I understand that there is a very, uh, uh, I saw a two different narrative of two uh, communities. And Israel was the, the, uh, there, you know, let's say, let, I put it in another way. Until 1993, there was one only book about Holocaust literature in Hebrew in Israel. There was, in America, something like 100 books. Uh, the basic uh, uh, narrative in the Jewish community in the uh, in state it's some kind of repetition of the same uh, narrative of something is doing has very very bad thing then we are in a way survived by God or by the other different way and then again you know it can be Paro and Hitler and so and so on and in Israel it wasn't like this it Israel it was a kind of uh, escalative narrative a uh, way of we are was in very very bad shape in the show and from there we are we are only you know like a modern a modern narrative you know something like a modernistic narrative but it changed it changed and we took it from the Gola, the Gola, the, 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 the concept and I am very very sorry about it you know maybe we have to do something in, in between well on this rather the Well, not rather very pessimistic no <laughs> <laughs> professor Eagle Schwartz uh, will wrap up uh, we were discussing among other things your uh, latest book in English the Zionist paradox Hebrew literature and Israeli identity thank you very much thank you very much That was the Tel Aviv Review for this week. Thank you very much for listening. Big thanks to the technical producers of this show, Adam Scher and Lior Pelleg. I am Gilad Halpern, signing off here in Tel Aviv. Do join us again for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review next week. And until then, goodbye. Time